And then uh, let me first of all introduce the, the members of the panel for this uh, final uh, approximately half hour discussion this afternoon. Uh, we have Andy Shaw from, uh, from DEFRA, Professor John Crawford from uh, Rothamsted Research, and Dr. Jim uh, Godfrey from Innovate UK. Uh, and they are going to give us a three to five minute introduction uh, each uh, on, on their views uh, on today's discussions. Uh, and then we'll open up questions uh, from the floor um, and we'll uh, aim to, to finish in, in, in about half an hour uh, with a few closing remarks and then you'll be pleased to hear there's a, a reception that follows. Um, so if I can pass it over to just down the line, Andy, first. Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Martin. And just before I start, just uh, congratulations to Martin and the team for putting on what's been a really stimulating uh, uh, day. Um, I'm, my name's Andy. I'm actually standing in for Ian Boyd, uh, the uh, Chief Scientific Advisor at DEFRA. Uh, DEFRA, as you're probably aware, is um, the department responsible for food, uh, environment, food and rural affairs. But we also have a responsibility in earth observation, which extends to leading the UK line on the Copernicus programme and being the representatives to the GEO programme, which Barbara pre presented us, to us this morning. Um, and as an organisation, we are keen to exploit the benefits of Earth observation, both for internal policy purpose requirements and, if we can, to help stimulate activity beyond our borders uh, and, and, and ever more so, as, as, as I'll describe. I was given the remit to say, actually, how can government help support this industry? So that's uh, maybe what I'll focus on. Our policy requirements, as you're probably aware, and you've picked some of them up today, are, are extremely broad. We have to pay farmers subsidies and then monitor what they do with the money. Um, we have to worry about the environment, the water quality, air quality, and there's areas there that overlap into agriculture that we maybe haven't touched on. Uh, there's some exciting things going on in government in policy circles around natural capital and getting um, our, our natural environment uh, valued and into the national accounts. And we're explicitly asking this community to say, how can we use this kind of data and information to help us value the extent, the location, quality of natural capital. If that happens, if that gets into national accounts, then that would be a very significant thing for this community. Uh, sustainable intensification, of course, is very important. We've heard a lot about that. Uh, and agri-environment schemes in general. We pay millions of pounds a year to encourage farmers and others to manage the environment to produce positive environmental outcomes. Um, and we're interested in things, well, how did those subsidies work? How does our landscape look now? Um, and we haven't really touched on that today, and there's, there's, there's a lot behind that. And then risk management in general, not just uh, natural environmental risk, but risk throughout this food supply chain. Uh, all sorts of things, animal health, plant health, that we have to cover. It's an extremely broad remit. I thought, well, if the question is how can a, a, a lowly organisation like DEFRA help this industry, I've couched it in three ways. Uh, as customer, as innovator, and as enabler. I'll take those in order. Firstly, of course, for industry people, what you really want is, is, uh, is a contract. You want us to buy products from you. You want us to be a customer. And that's not unknown. Uh, we do procure data and services from various remote sensing companies. Um, whether we can increase that in, in terms of, say, an anchor tenancy is, uh, to help stimulate other growth is a question we're looking at. What could we invest in that actually helps industry and others then use that as a platform for growth? It's not our natural territory. It's, generally more a, a department for business sort of question. And of course, we're not the US where there are massive DOD budgets to, to buy commercial data, which acts as a platform for them to sell more products. We generally try to be an intelligent customer, so to, to buy what we need to, to come in, but of course, not all our needs are commercially interesting to you. Um, you might be interested in selling precision farming services, but you're maybe not so concerned about habitat quality. But we have to be concerned about that. So we have lots of internal activity that takes this data and creates models around things like, are we improving the quality of our natural environment? Uh, sometimes we look at data, but then we're, we're generally source um, uh, neutral. And, but obviously, a lot of people want to sell us their particular brand of data. Um, so we have questions around how we how we pick and choose which data sources we need. Uh, services is a good thing, and the whole GMES, now Copernicus debate, went down the lines of government and people don't want data, they want services. And the services we're getting are kind of okay. We've analyzed and they, they might work okay at a pan-European level, not so good for us nationally. So what that has done is driven us back to data and how can we then turn the raw data into things that do work for us at a national scale. 
So some thoughts there about being a customer. Uh, I bet you're aware DEFRA budgets are going down, so it's maybe not the most exciting areas to focus on. Innovation. You never heard of a civil servant say the government has a lead on innovation. We're trying to be innovative because we have to be. The cuts we're facing and the, the job stays the same, but we have to be innovative in what we do. Uh, recent um, science and technology um, parliamentary committee referred to us as a trailblazer in this area of Earth observation applications. It's quite gratifying to be uh, approved off in such a way. We are trying to link all our needs and be as effective and efficient as possible in meeting those with all these kind of technologies. And finally, as enabler, which I think is probably the most important one, around, particularly around the area of in, in, uh, regulatory functions, and we, we have in, in our uh, organisation a, a better regulation function, which we are now starting to talk to and say, right, if we've got these reliable sources of information, it might be from satellites directly or a, you know, an institutional programme like um, Copernicus, or it might be maybe if it's from a commercial company, can we rely on that? Can we start building policy around that? And you know, then you get involved in the whole policy cycle of evaluating what you can and can't do uh, and all that kind of thing. We're enabling people through open data. So very pleased to hear Barbara's views on, on open data and the value of doing that because, as you're probably aware, the Secretary of State has said we want to be a data-driven organisation and we're making up to 8,000 government data sets openly available and I think by the end of this month we'll have achieved that in one year. Quite what we can do with all those is really we need your help to look at that and think where can we really maximise the use of that kind of thing. But it sets, a, sets out our stall about open data. And, of course, government can help convene various players uh, to look at some of these issues, you know, if it's natural capital or if it's efficient supply chains and all those sorts of things. So just a few thoughts there. Here's some ideas just to stimulate and get you, keep you awake. If we're talking about open data, why, why five metres as a limitation, limiting factor? Why not take it all the way? Um, uh, I heard a group say that our research council situation was, was really good. I don't think so at all. I think our research council funding in earth observation for agriculture has been lacking for many years. The whole agritech thing is a response to lack of investment in this area. So let's have a fight about that one. But I think there's lots we need to do in research to turn earth observation into products that government and others can use that need to be based on good science, and we have not been doing that. Synthetic aperture radar is getting a big profile now. It's really important. It's a fantastic opportunity. But there's not been enough research to tell us really quite what we're getting in that blind man through the field thing. Um, can we have an inf uh, a space for smarter industry programme? We have a space for smarter government programme. Um, but policy making is a certain challenge, and it's taken me seven plus years to try, and I still don't understand it. Um, it's hard work trying to understand what really motivates government, and if we want to make government a customer or enabler, maybe we need to have you come into government and learn how it really works and what, it's, what the challenges really are. So I'm cautiously optimistic. I probably got out the wrong side of the bed today, but it's been a really good day, but I still think we've got lots of challenges, and happy to talk more about it. <clears throat> You're clearly a new breed of... Uh civil servant. Well, I'm not really a civil servant. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps we can have a few more clones. Anyway, moving right along. Um, well, thank you very much, and I have actually thoroughly enjoyed today. I didn't quite know what, uh, uh, um, uh, what uh, today would all be about, but I have found it very interesting. Yes, uh, um, my day job is actually a farmer in Lincolnshire and Yorkshire. I grow a range of arable crops, and uh, I breed and uh, fatten pigs. Um, I am listed as from Innovate UK, um, which I, I chaired one of the IP platforms there. What I can tell you is that the, uh, uh, the, the recent call for satellite to improve agri-food systems, um, I think we are awaiting a minister's announcement on that very shortly. We were hoping it was going to be uh, last night, but uh, for various reasons it ha has been delayed for, and it will be announced in due course. Um, what I thought I would do would uh, just give you some examples of, uh, of my experience of satellite, uh, using satellite um, technology. Uh, back in 1992, um, I was actually chairman of the Potato Marketing Board at that time, and we, one of the things we did was monitor the uh, potato crop and uh, give an estimate of, uh, of yields. And by the first week of September, uh, we were we had got our crop check weighings were coming in showing us with an enormous crop. We had also implemented that year a start of a three-year program using satellite imagery to see whether we could uh, um, use modelling to uh, 
uh, as, a, as a different approach to this. So we looked at the modelling of, of that, and uh, very rudimentary in those days, that certainly by the time we got to end of August, it was actually quite easy to identify potato fields from really the only two other green crops in uh, growing in potato growing areas was sugar beet and grass, so we could actually identify potato crops. And we saw there was a full canopy cover of uh, uh, the potato crop at that time, normally in high potato yields in years, a potato blight comes in and you start to lose canopy, but we weren't that year and we ended up with the most massive potato crop, but we did, uh, did get forewarning. Um, so, um, and then in uh, the early 2000s, I was chairman of the International Potato Centre and we were working on potatoes and sweet potatoes and we were particularly interested in looking at introducing orange flesh sweet potatoes into uh, sub-Saharan Africa and in, in particularly into Uganda. Um, because of uh, the beneficial effects of trying to improve the uh, vitamin A intake of uh, particularly uh, uh, um, mothers and uh, children. And uh, so we went to the FAO to get the data, satellite data of the, where these um, sweet potatoes were growing, and when we put that on a map, lo and behold, we found that a considerable proportion of the sweet potatoes in uh, Uganda were actually growing, according to FAO, in Lake Victoria. So um, uh, we had to uh, do a verification, ground verification of that. But what I'm saying is actually things have moved forward considerably uh, as we are now. Uh, currently, I'm actually uh, chairman of the International Rice Research Institute. And just to pick up Barbara Ryan's point on the crop crisis situation, uh, we are actually working with the, uh, particularly the governments of the Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, and India, because actually in South and Southeast Asia, currently there is quite a major drought. Uh, in that area, they do can get two to three crops a year. Um, but with the current drought, there is a very concern over the, the food supplies, and we're, you know, we're monitoring crop planting, growth, and harvesting using uh, radar technology because of the, the cloud cover. Uh, and that work, I think, is going particularly well. And I do think that it will be interesting. The traders, I think, will also be interested in that. And it may have some if, impact on the, uh, if India particularly decides to uh, import uh, grains, um, it could have some in, uh, effect on, on the grain market. But we'll have to see, wait and see what India does in particular. In the UK, uh, I was at uh, the cereals event, the main arable event in the, in the country, a couple of days ago, and I was speaking to Rothamsted, and I'm sure John Crawford may pick this up, and I looked at their, uh, um, their um, application platform that they run on uh, smartphones to uh, uh, monitor crop pests and diseases, and I think that's a very useful uh, um, application. Um, at the National Institute of Agricultural Botany, um, NIAB, they're using an app there, and NIAB is a members organisation, and they ask members to um, <clears throat> let them have details of their fields and the positions they are, varieties of crops grown, and we at NIAB can then alert them at time of flowering of oilseed rape, of pollen beetle, for instance, and within a couple of days, members can respond to us, and they actually give us the dates of flowering and um, if they get pollen beetle, and it's a fantastic two-way flow of information from NIAB to the members and then back again and we have data from all over the country. It's a fantastic actually crowdsourcing uh, feedback of information. And we can alert for other diseases such as yellow rust and we've actually introduced a, uh, a weather forecasting um, uh, part to that uh, application. So it's a very powerful tool for this two-way flow of information and helps the impact of um, um, and IABS and um, um, John Innes and Rothamsted's uh, R&D. Um, in my own business, farming business, we've used GPS since the early 2000s. So we've got yield maps, soil analysis, PK, drainage, and we've done potato cyst nematodes. Uh, I have to say, I think we're only touching the surface of using this information. And uh, but what I would say, I think in general, I think farmers do take up new technology quite quickly when, you know, there are incentives to do so. You know, they take up new machinery, GPS applications on smartphones, field data, new varieties, uh, robotic milking machines. And, I'd, and in the environmental area, I just remarked that within two years of the environmental 
uh, entry level scheme being introduced, 67% um, of the English farm area was entered into ELS. So, you know, they do, farmers will move quickly when the incentives are there. And coming to, to uh, Simon Blackmore's um, um, uh, point on, uh, I do think we will be using small tractors and robots, you know, when the, the, uh, um, the, the companies, machinery manufacturers start to move into that area, I think there will be quite a quick uptake on that, um, in, particularly in the high value crops. Um, I think looking at today, you know, a couple of things really have come home to me of positive change is, you know, is the, the free access and the increasing amounts of data that there are, uh, particularly from, from satellite and uh, uh, you know, other, other sensing technology. And also I think the challenge of co uh, the connectivity and the compatibility of data, I mean, they are challenges. I think these both have fantastic potentials for the future and, you know, we're really only just starting out on that journey. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I come from a slightly different perspective um, in that I used to be, well, I suppose I still am a physicist. Um, uh, in fact, an astrophysicist. So I used to use satellites, but we pointed them out the way and, and tried to use mathematics and things to figure out what all that data meant. Um, and now I'm a soil scientist, so this is actually my meeting because, you know, it brings astronomy and, and uh, soil science together. Although it, there wasn't enough soil science, I have to say. Uh, there wasn't enough discussion about soil. I'll come back to that later. Um, so my perspective on all of this, and I think I was sort of asked to come up with, um, you know, the where next and the, the kind of the scientific vision bit about the what we can use all this uh, technology and gadgetry for. Um, and I think fundamentally, uh, we, we, this, the food system does face profound challenges. And over the next 20, probably 20 years, um, which is a stunningly short time. Uh, and between now and then, we have to reposition the food system um, to support both environmental and human health. And, and the reason why I think that we need to, uh, to connect those uh, dimensions is because they're actually self-reinforcing um, solutions. I'll come back to that a little bit more as, as well. So we, we've heard about the challenge we've got from water. So, so agriculture is kind of a, a, a risk hub, if you like. There's a whole bunch of global risks, all of which converge onto agriculture and, and the food system, uh, water, biodiversity, and biodiversity, I'm talk, thinking about the, 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 the role of the wider um, environment in, for example, processes relating to development of resistance in, in the food system, um, but also all the other ecosystem services that we depend on for, for, for other things other than agriculture. Soil, of course, part of the, um, the one of the most diverse ecosystems. Um, Food the, or the shortage of food um, is an issue for the UK, despite the fact that we are a relatively rich nation, our food is relatively cheap, um, because food is becoming a, a security issue now in many countries. And uh, to a significant extent, the migration crisis that we're seeing right now has its origins in food security or lack of food security. Um, in, in countries that then stem social unrest and created an environment in which extremism can can uh, uh, can, can grow. So the, the the topic of this uh, this meeting, I think, is of, of profound importance. The, and and I think this, the solutions to uh, to the problems are are very different to the to in fact, even the whole scientific approach uh, need, needs to be a bit, a bit different. In the next 20 years, we have to do the green revolution again in terms of the increase in, in production. Uh, we've got to do it again. We've got to do it in half the time. We've got to do it with far less energy, um, less inputs, and where all of the easy stuff has already been achieved. And one of the, one of the um, 
and we, several presentations today made this point as well, that, that the, the kinds of solutions that we found um, to, to meet the demand for, and it was a spectacular success in, 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 sense, in terms of increasing yield, but it created a whole bunch of unintended consequences, many of which are now the depleting natural resources on which continued food uh, production depends. And so we need a much more integrated approach to, to agriculture. Um, it's much more about ensuring that the solutions that we find don't create these new unintended consequences. Um, it's also about the solutions are self-reinforcing, so when you fix something over here, it actually makes it easier to fix something else over here. It's about the management of interconnected risks, which is what I think is a reasonably convenient way of summarising what we mean by sustainability. Um, and if we're going to manage interconnected risk, um, we have to make sure that the data and knowledge in the various dimensions that impact on agriculture can be uh, integrated. And we talked a lot about that today. Um, so earth observation or, or looking at the earth, whether it's, it's there was a lot of focus on, on satellite, but of course there's a whole bunch of other ways of sensing and observing and measuring uh, the environment uh, of relevance to, to agriculture. And we need to make sure that we know how to uh, link all that data together and to make it as freely available as possible, and we talked a lot about that. The other thing I would say about data is that um, more is not necessarily better. Um, so that there's, there's a tendency in science that to, to create techniques of generating more and more data, imagining that more data makes it easier. And actually, I think what we need is better theory and better theory which then informs what data we actually need, rather than necessarily measuring something simply because we can. The other thing about in, so going beyond uh, the integration of data is about how do we put that data to use um, and, and creating value from that data. It's not all about gadgets, but it's about understanding how to, um, how to interpret that data and how to get new knowledge that's useful for understanding how we, uh, how we have this much more integrated approach to, um, to agriculture, a much more joined up approach. Um, the other thing I would say that we focused a lot today inside all the farm gate, and, and actually I think there are fantastic opportunities and critical opportunities in connecting right across the whole food chain from earth observation and related technologies. Every, I was going to say everyone carries a phone except me, I've left it down on the table. We, we all carry personal devices that, that uh, are, are constantly monitoring our health and our lifestyle. Um, uh, food packaging increasingly uh, contains devices that allow it to be tracked globally, in fact, as commodities are, are, are shifted and moved uh, across, across the world. So I think, and this comes back to this point about a food system that, that supports both environmental and human health. Environmental health, it's a no-brainer because the food system requires a healthy environment in which to, uh, to continue. The, the human health bit is, well, of course we want human health, but actually um, by connecting right across the food chain and embracing the complexity, it's easier to find solutions because uh, a diet that is more supportive of human health also reduces the demand uh, from the supply side and makes it easier to find a more sustainable intensification of agriculture. But we do need good ways of joining up that, uh, connecting uh, the information across the, the supply chain. And I think all of the technologies that we've talked about today can play a role in that. I spent the last year and a half of my life almost putting together one of these new fancy agri-tech centres called Agrimetrics uh, with a couple of friends. And um, we spoke to a lot of companies um, to try and understand what, uh, what the needs were in, in the sector. And so Agrimetrics is all about data, data integration and sustainable agriculture uh, and the use of data uh, to improve uh, productivity and efficiency in, 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 across the whole food chain. And it was quite interesting talking to, to more than 200 companies across that spanned the whole food chain. We were able to identify 
five different sort of themes where there are, uh, there are opportunities, all of which I think are relevant to the technologies that we've talked today. First of all, um, managing within season risk, better management of within season risk. Um, horizon scanning, understanding what the challenges to the food system or the supply chain may be a year or 10 years down the line. Um, that's about forecasting. Um, sustainability metrics, how do we measure sustainability? Now that we've got incredible, uh, sophisticated ways of, of sensing the environment and then integrating those sensors, how do we come up with better metrics and a more coherent, uh, convergent set of metrics for sustainability? Um, food safety and quality and provenance of food, understanding following food from where it's grown, from the soil in which it's grown, all the way through to the consumer, so that we know what we're getting, uh, we know we can monitor the quality and make sure that action is taken during the journey to uh, ensure continued uh, quality and safety of food. And then finally, uh, what the, the final theme was, was all about interpreting spatial temporal data, which is what we've been talking about all day. Um, a huge challenge, uh, the, the statistics and the mathematics of, of interpreting spatial temporal data is still cutting edge. We've still got a lot to learn, we can still do better. The other, I guess the surprising thing for me, and, and it's important for um, delivering the results that we've talked about today, is that the agri-food sector, with a few exceptions, is not actually in a position yet, I think, to embrace the opportunities of the kinds of technologies that, we, uh, that we've been talking about today. There's a lack of leadership in the sector in, in the quantitative side of life, uh, and how to use data, um, how to prioritise uh, the collection and the use of data within the company and how to be how to allow that part that dimension of of the business to uh, play a more proactive role in in the evolution of of the uh, of, of the company or, or business so there's a massive need there I think uh, in order for all of this clever stuff to actually impact um, just to finish then on where I think some of the biggest challenges are um, I think technology may be half the answer. The other half of the answer is behaviour change, uh, just not doing silly things. I'm quite optimistic about the future because I think that we can do things a lot better. But we have to find ways, better ways of engaging um, in an almost participatory way stakeholders with the science and, uh, and involve them um, so that we better understand where they're coming from and vice versa. Um, how, well, I suppose, the, yeah, the, the other issue is coming back to this food chain thing. Who, who takes responsibility for the food chain? Um, companies and researchers and other individuals will focus on elements of the food chain and, and market forces and other things will aim to optimise and make those optimally efficient in some way. But just because the pieces of the chain, or rather more accurately, not the food chain, but the food network, just because those pieces are um, optimised does not mean, in fact, by any stretch of the imagination, does not mean that the network itself is optimised. So who takes responsibility for that? And who's going to invest in that? And how are we going to get the necessary um, collaborations, both nationally and internationally, for that, for that to happen? I, th I think that's a good, good point of which we might take a, a few moments now to see if there's some questions from the, from the floor, okay. because we're, we're running close to, to time. Um, and I certainly would like to, to give the audience who've been very patient an uh, opportunity to, uh, to raise some questions. Again, if you can just briefly state your affiliation and a concise question, that would be much appreciated. Toby Bruce, Rothamsted Research. It's been, it's been a really fascinating day today, but uh, I'd, I'd like to um, link this to, together with your um, um, Reaping the Benefits Sustainable Intensification Report, because I, I, th I think that that report, it, 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 that, was, that was a real sort of um, groundbreaking report that a lot of other reports have kind of echoed in after, afterwards, but it set, this, set out the, the, the challenges that we face with agriculture this century, and we need a... As um, 
as uh, John Crawford and some of the other speakers mentioned, we need, we need a, 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 a second um, green revolution this, this, this century, which is going to be a lot more knowledge intensive because the, the green revolution that we had last century, it was basically throwing on more inputs and getting more yield. But now what the challenge that we face um, this century is, is a lot more sophisticated and it's going to need a, a lot more intelligent agriculture. And so I, I find it... Um, uh, very, very encouraging the, the, the discussions that we've had today because uh, because it, it, it does um, the, with this direction of travel you, you can see um, the, the development of um, knowledge intensive agriculture for the to, to deliver this type of green revolution that we're going to need in the in the in the 21st century thank you very much let's take a couple of questions and then with some final comments any other any other questions uh, percolating in the audience Last time. Ah, yes, one right in the front. Um, just out of curiosity, so I think today we've obviously focused a lot on technology that makes Can sense. Can you hold it a bit closer? Sorry. Okay. Today we've been focusing a lot on technology that makes sense as an agri tech event. But I was wondering what um, opportunities you think there are to not only to look outside of just agri tech, but how can we tie it together with economics and even the more social sciences. Um, so for example, I thought there was uh, an interesting point today when we were talking about the robot computers, where I thought, you know, that's great. Yes, we have smallholder farmers, and yes, they'd love to use these, but if you ask most smallholder farmers, they don't actually want to be farmers. <laughs> so I was wondering, you know, how we might, are we actually thinking, should we be thinking about this in terms of the whole social economic area as well? Thank you. And last call for any other questions? One just over in the corner. If you can hold on to those questions, and then we'll have one minute each to answer. So going back to the issue of soil, it's been a fascinating day, but one of the areas is indeed the loss of the soil into the oceans and the rivers. So how is this technology going to assist decisions that are actually going to reduce these risks as we go forward in an intensive system of agriculture or in a protected system of agriculture. Would somebody like to? Thank you. Well, we'll, we'll sort of collect these and then I'll ask the panel's uh, uh, members quickly to answer. Any, any other questions to throw in the mix? Nope. In which case, uh, bearing keeping an eye on the, on the clock, um, if each of you could just give one minute uh, on your uh, on, uh, and address these from your own particular points of view, and just to inform you that I have a lever here with a trapdoor. Uh, <laughs> so after one minute, the, the trapdoor opens and you vanish from sight. Andy, you you're turn to Graham Norton. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know about the loss of soil. Um, hopefully, I mean we can see from some systems uh, turbidity and you know as it comes out in the wash or whatever, wherever how how we feed that back to where it's being lost from. I'll leave to someone who knows more about soil than me. I really like the question about socioeconomics. We're asking that all the time in Defra, uh, and the table over here that was asking that question. I want to talk more with those guys because yeah, we're asking that all the time. You know, when we're dealing with public money. What should we be investing it in? And you know, you have opportunities and opportunity costs. And if you're not investing in one area, you're, you're losing another area, whatever. Um, we don't have really good metrics to convince ourselves that our investments in all this technology pay off for public good or in terms of externalities. And I'd really like to have a conversation with p people, particularly economists, who can give me a good approach to capturing, with all the complexity of the technology, a simple way that my DEFRA economists can understand is it total factor productivity, is it total resource productivity, what's the metric uh, that makes sense when, you, when you're employing public money? Yeah, it's a really important question. Right, the uh, uh, sustainable intensification, I think that was more of a statement and, and you know, I'd concur and agree with you on your comments on that. In terms of the um, 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 socio-economics, um, robotics, smallholder, and the issues around smallholder farmers, um, yeah, I think it's um, it is a real issue, is that? But you know, um, certainly in my work in the um, with the International Rice Research Institute, I mean, what we do not want to perpetuate is you know the woman and the hoe and the child on a back that has to go and work every day of the year, long hours every day, in, you know, repetitive, monotonous work. And you go and ask them, they actually don't want that for their children. So, you know, and I think that, it, it, you know, it, it's a question we need to ask in, in, in this country is, 
you know, um, do we want that sort of menial repetitive work? Uh, you know, I think this is where technology can help us to, to uh, uh, take, take those sort of, if you like, very menial tasks at, um, out. Um, soils into rivers and wash away. I suppose the easy answer to that is that uh, you know we've got to look at rotations and uh, not having uh, um, bare land, particularly during winter time, um, contour farming, so that uh, we you know work across slopes rather than the, than up and down. So I think a lot of the, the, there's a lot of knowledge about this, but it's probably making sure it gets um, gets implemented. Yeah, I'm not going to add too much because it's already been said, but just other than endorse the, the, the need to have good social and economic sciences embedded in everything that, that we do. Um, and soil loss, yeah, there are ways of, of, of measuring that and better in, uh, coupling of, of in-soil sensors with other types of remote sensing uh, is probably the way to go. Thank you. I mean, certainly... Uh, um Using satellite remote sensing, you can see the outflow from from rivers and see the sediments that are coming out. And so I think there's a uh, a good opportunity to at least see what's happening and then uh, looking at what you can do to perhaps uh, minimise that. Well, thank you very much. Well, this this brings us uh, actually spot on time to the to the closing uh, a few closing remarks. And <clears throat> first of all, it's been a very diverse and, and active. Uh, discussion and participation, and I'd like to thank everybody for, for doing so. It was, you know, I think, again, one of the most uh, uh, good indicators of this was the fact it's actually quite difficult to pull people back from the, uh, from the discussions that have been taking place over the, uh, the, the lunch and, and coffee breaks. Um, of course, a, a whole range of key topics have been highlighted, and, and it, it's impossible in a few moments to to pull out all of these together, uh, but I'm sure that the, uh, the Royal Society will <clears throat> produce a summary of, of this, and, and hopefully that will be uh, available uh, in due course. So you can use that as an aid memoir from the discussions. <clears throat> I think, however, the, you know, a number of the points that have come out have been focusing on the availability of data, the guarantee of long-term supply of that data, because if, if uh, the agri-tech agri community is going to um, make its transition into making better use of this and investing in that. They want to be sure that that data supply is, is going to be there in the long term and making sure that the connections between the data suppliers and generators you know, in the space segment uh, and the end users in the agricultural community, that connection needs to be strengthened. That was indeed the whole purpose of uh, today's meeting. Um, and I was particularly struck by one of the discussions I was uh, sitting in on uh, uh, during the, the, the table discussions, which is, in the end, the, the end user, who is the, the farmer, in, uh, who wishes to uh, either uh, treat his crops or know when to uh, harvest them and, and the other uh, uh, activities that we've heard discussed today, want a simple interface. They want to be able to have a file which they can upload into their tractor or whatever machinery, uh, uh, which uh, then will go off and, and do what's needed. They want a, a simple map or something that gives them confidence that things are roughly in the right place and doing the right things that they would expect, and then they need to off and run it. So just like when you... Uh, you have an app and you, and you use Uber to get a car. You don't want to worry about all the infrastructure, the processing, and everything goes on in the background. You just want to know that a car is going to turn up and you're going to get in it and going to go to the right place and pay the right amount. And that's, I think, the goal uh, that we have in connecting satellites down to, to soil to make it uh, actually independent of the technology just to make it useful to the, uh, to the user. I think... I, I'm quite convinced that, uh, that, that space and agritech are on the verge of a, of a major uh, opportunity to benefit from a number of three elements that are sort of coming together. Uh, first of all is the uh, increased data sources which are being and about to be generated uh, from satellite constellations where we get more data, hopefully of the right and useful variety, more quickly and with greater time resolution. Um, and then this can be uh, linked into, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the big data uh, growth that we're seeing so that 
large databases can be established and opportunities then to drill down into those uh, databases in order to extract particular facets in which we can generate uh, uh, actionable knowledge. And then the final link in the chain has been independently of this, of course, the establishment of a very comprehensive communications network, the internet, uh, which allows this data and knowledge to be disseminated quickly and almost effortlessly to almost everywhere in the, in the country. And these three things together, I think, are going to fundamentally uh, change the way that we link, let's say, space and satellites to, to soil. So at this conference today is not, not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. Um, but uh, it, it is really the beginning of a conversation between the space community and the agricultural community and trying to see how each can better inform the other so that we can get the best exploitation of these new uh, capabilities. I do hope that all the connections that, that we've made here and the discussions that uh, we've had you know, will strengthen this uh, link, and it obviously needs to be developed further, and I'm sure this will not be the, the last of these uh, opportunities for, for discussion. Um, I do hope that uh, each of you, uh, from whatever viewpoint you, you've brought to the uh, meeting, have found it useful and uh, stimulating, and that it will in encourage a wider use of, of all these technologies so that we can both in, improve the, the yields of agriculture, because we're going to need more, more food, uh, whilst at the same time protecting the quality of our valuable uh, land resources, as has just been mentioned. Um, in, in concluding, I, I, I would, of course, like to thank all the speakers today who have uh, shared their thoughts uh, with us, and, and of course also you, the audience, who have first of all listened, secondly come up with some quite uh, challenging uh, questions, and also we've had lots of useful discussions uh, outside the, the formal part of the, the meeting. Uh, last, uh, but not least at all, of course, I would like to, to thank my co-chairs who have helped bring this together. It was very gratifying to see such a large uh, turnout from such a diverse uh, background. And of course, the, the, not last, but uh, the uh, staff of the, of the Royal Society uh, who have uh, uh, really um, worked hard on this. Uh, Philippa in particular, I don't know if she is still here somewhere in the background, uh, who, who worked with us to, to uh, and others in the Royal Society, Liz and others who have really worked hard to uh, make this happen. Um, this is uh, the end of the, today's uh, formal part of the discussion uh, and I'd like to invite you to, to join us in the, uh, in the reception, which I guess is in one of the adjacent rooms. Oh, yes, now I can see. Thank you. Just there, yes, just outside. Please join us there. Continue to have the discussions. And uh, thank you very much indeed for all your contributions this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.